What I want to talk about now is something that's critical in our program. And if you think about where a lot of the uh, technical gets done, it's this issue of establishing a baseline. As many of you know, and as I've alluded to before, if you start out with a lousy baseline, I mean, it's just like the, uh, everything falls through the, through the floor from that point on. So one of the things that's important is how you establish a valid energy use baseline. I'll go through that uh, quickly, again, because we've got only about 20 minutes for this presentation. And we want to stay, Genevieve keeps us on target to stay on time. And then uh, I want to do talk about some of the non-conventional scenarios that we deal with, such as vacant property, repositioned property, things of that nature. And um, although initially I didn't know it was even going to be part of our program, uh, CPACE and CFIA decided it, it is part of the program, and we came up with methodologies that I'll share with you on how one would deal with it. As I go through the non-conventional scenarios, if people have other options, you know, certainly we're open to listen to it. But uh, I'll talk about what's being done right now, at least so far. Okay, as I go through this, I want to talk about, uh, say a few words about why you need a good baseline, what constitutes a valid baseline as we view it, what data needs to be collected, where does the data go, um, what does our data management platform do with the data, uh, and then I'm going to get into those scenarios, not the conventional one, which we've all been talking about, but these non-conventional, and draw a couple of conclusions. Again, as before, it's informal, so if you have questions, and I really appreciate all the questions we had in the first presentation as we go through this, raise your hand. Uh, any questions open, any, and if I can't answer it, obviously, uh, we've got somebody here, we've got other people here that, that might be able to. Why the need? <clears throat> Clearly, uh, you got to have it to determine energy savings, because energy savings are against the baseline, as, as I alluded to before. And there's two categories that we generally see. The first is if you're just dealing with energy conservation measures. The second is if you're putting in renewable energy. They're dealt with a little differently. And we have many projects that combine the two. So, and, and again, there's no magic. You know, the, the ECM issue here that I talked about is pretty much what I showed you in that graph. You know, the actual versus what it would have been without those ECMs. Renewable energy systems are relatively easy. You might say, well, the energy savings are pretty straightforward. How much electricity is being produced? Uh, that's of interest to us, obviously, but we have a lot of other things that we're interested in, like how much energy does the building use? How much is going to be replaced with solar? How does it vary by month? Things of that nature. So we'll take a quick look at both of those. Uh, and we do, when we go through the technical review, and if I touch on stuff that you have a question on and I, we don't have time to get into it, remember we're here to help. Just give a call and uh, certainly we can go through the, in much detail as you would like. What constitutes a valid baseline? And as I alluded to in the original presentation, we rely on the ASTM BIPA standard. Fundamentally, there's some big things that are critical. We like to get the data as far back as three years. <clears throat> or to the last major renovation. So you've got to have some feel for when that last major, if any, has been made. Uh, and if you have data less than three years, certainly you can uh, go, but you've got to have a minimum of at least one year data. Uh, a lot of data we saw collected in a big study in New York on multifamily was collecting data for six months or nine months, which is ludicrous, but that's what they did. We define what a major renovation is that you see. We also, everything we do, in, from benchmarking on down, we base it on gross floor area, GFA, okay? 99% of the numbers and the people you talk to don't know what that is. In commercial real estate, when we use the word floor area, we don't use gross floor area. Where do we make money? On the leasable or the rentable square. <laughs> that we know. So in many cases, the numbers you see or given to you may not be this. It may be the rentable or leasable. I did a project for EPA when they were putting together portfolio manager. And they were looking at the old CBEX data. And I was taking a closer look. We were randomly selecting properties. We were looking at square footages for their benchmarking program. Guess what? A good number of them were rentable or leasable square foot versus actual gross floor area. 
So what happens if I use a rentable square foot instead of a gross floor area? What happens to the number? The energy use intensity, what does it do? Yes. You want to use that in benchmarking? Those are things, you know, us in commercial real estate, that's all part of the process that was developed and behind developing the ASTM standard. Because what we saw, a lot of these disclosure projects were using EPA's benchmark data, which obviously is the data collected in 2003 by DOE. I mean, it's ancient. Okay, and we, you know, we don't mind benchmarking properties. I have no problem with it, as long as it doesn't impact me financially. The instant I have to start disclosing it to prospective purchasers, that's impacting my pocketbook. And now I want to make sure things are apples to apples. And that's why a lot of the real estate industry started taking a much, much closer look at what, where is the data? What is the data? Where did it come from? Is it accurate? What's the error factor around it? There's a lot of problems with portfolio manager and uh, EPA's benchmarking data. Anyway, um, we try to make sure that when you do put numbers in, you know, you distinguish between gross floor area and leasable or rentable. The other thing is we need the typical things you'd expect to see, electricity use and fuel use, duh. But we also need to have some feel for those independent variables that can impact energy use of a building. <clears throat> Weather, you don't have to worry about. Heating degree days, cooling degree days. When you go into our data management platform, you just put where the property is and automatically all the weather data statistically analyzed over the last, I don't know, I think uh, 20 years, whatever it is, all statistically analyzed automatically is built into the analysis. But we don't know things like this. So you've got to get some feel for occupancy, vacancy. Okay, if the building's been half vacant for part of the time in the baseline, then, it's, then the vacancy rate goes up. We'd like to know what the, where the changes were in vacancy because that's an independent variable that can impact energy use. The operating hours, although many of the buildings for the, once you know the type of building, they have a pretty straightforward way of uh, uh, approaching operating hours. They're pretty consistent. If there's changes in tenant use profiles, we had one particular project where one of the tenants added a data center. Nobody even talked about it. You've got to have some feel for that. At least ask the question. And then certainly, uh, if there have been any renovations, what were they, when did they occur? So those are a little extra things. But bear in mind, when the ASTM standard and the software, the, the data management platform, you're going to see demoed uh, this afternoon, when it operates, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take all this data up here, and you're going to get two equations, one for electricity and one for fuel use. It's going to regress all the actual data against independent variables. Okay, so it's important to know what they are. <clears throat> Obviously, if there's no change in something, you're not going to worry about uh, regressing, but if there are changes, you want to at least be aware of them. So that's something that you may not ordinarily have talked to a client about, but it is important uh, in, in our process. <clears throat> we like to get the energy cost data, which is pretty straightforward. <coughs> Any building characteristics, and again, uh, this is pretty straightforward stuff, no magic to it, but you'll see these questions asked in the data management platform. At least you know what it is. And again, I'll emphasize this, okay, when you put the square foot in, at least ask the owner and ask, you know, maybe you should ask them what's the gross square footage and what's the rentable or leasable square footage. Knowing this is a subset of that. Where does the data go? Everything, as you're going to see demoed at 1, at, uh, one o'clock after lunch, is going to go into our data management platform. You'll see how it goes in. You'll see ultimately how it's used uh, this afternoon, so I'm not going to spend much time with it. Uh, what does it do with the data? It does a lot of stuff with the data. You don't have to worry about, you know, if you've got fuel bills and the bills are from, you know, February 3rd to March 9th, what have you. You don't have to worry about converting everything to what we call calendarizing, monthly, putting it on a monthly basis. It's all done in our platform. Automatically, all the weather data is collected and it regresses in the uh, calculation of energy use without ECMs. It uses that weather data. And it ultimately comes up, as I said, with that equation. It generally does it. It'll look at total energy, but it more, it's more insightful to look at it and look at the equations from an electricity use standpoint and a fuel use standpoint. Uh, it looks at the 
Well, it normalizes it. It normalizes the data. When it normalizes data and it looks at energy savings, remember right up front you got to project what the energy savings are. Okay, this is right up front. You haven't put anything in. You just I got to project. What do I project on? What do I use as my basis? Well, the energy, the building energy use equation takes the mean values okay, of those independent variables. And it says that's what the energy use would be without the energy conservation measures. The consultants, the energy auditors, the contractors then go into the uh, data management platform and they, there's sections that they deal with where they're looking at what the energy savings would be. The percent improvement that you might get with a particular ECM. It goes through that process. And if you're going to model, and, and we have uh, many of the consultants that do look at modeling or spreadsheets, spreadsheet type models, when you're going to project what the system's going to look like, the energy use with ECMs, all we suggest very strongly to make it simple is use the mean values of the independent variables. Because uh, you got to somehow you got to assume something. You got to assume what are you going to assume for weather? Normalize based on mean. So when we normalize in our system, in the CDMP, everything is normalized based on mean values. That's average values. Um, what else? Okay, I want to get to this because this is a, this is the interesting part. Initially, we were just dealing with ECM, traditional ECMs, in a conventional building up upgrade, energy improvements being added. I'm adding some energy conservation measures. You know, it's an existing building, it's an office building. Uh, I want to get, I want to, I want to somehow get better net operating income, reduce my operating costs. What do I have to do? That's the normal run-of-the-mill stuff. But a number of contractors, consultants came in with these, we call them non-conventional scenarios. And fundamentally, all of them, as you'll see in a minute, there's not a lot of energy information data available. What do I do? Can you do a CPACE project? Well, the three that we laid out, with the first two bullets there being the most common, are first, if I have a fully or partially vacant building, it's there. I'm not repositioning it. It's an office building. I just got only 20% of the area is, is occupied. You know, it's been a really bad, lousy real estate market, and I'm going to get it ultimately better, but it's pretty lousy. Okay, what do I do? We'll see in a minute. The second is I got an existing building, maybe an old industrial factory. I'm going to convert it into high-end office space. No data. The industrial building was, you know, hadn't, hadn't been anybody in it for 50 years. What do I do? How do I deal with it? Can it be covered in CPACE? And the third was, well, you know, I'm dealing with uh, tenants who have their own meters. You know, especially in multifamily, well, you know, I can't really get the uh, uh, meter data or confidentiality, what have you. Okay, what do I do? Can I deal with this? How do, how do I deal with it? Suppose there's some of the units are vacant. How do I deal with it? Okay, so those were the three uh, issues with the first two being the most common in terms of these non-conventional scenarios where contractors came in and said, can we deal with it and see pace? The answer to all three is, yes, we can. Okay? Now, of course, the next question is, how? How do you deal with it? Let me go through each of them, and I'll talk about typically the way that it's handled. Okay? And we've been pretty satisfied with the way it's been done. First is if I got a, I got, you know, I got a building, it's not expected to change use. It's, it's an office building, it's going to stay an office building, what have you. It's just you know, partially vacant or it's fully vacant. Okay, if it's partially vacant, we allow you to extrapolate. So you can look at the part that's uh, occupied, look at the energy use, it's an office building, you got this amount that's occupied, and you can use a model to extrapolate what the energy use of the full building would be using all that existing equipment that's there. You're not going to touch anything, because then you're going to come back later with all the new high energy efficiency equipment. Okay. If it's fully vacant, and there's actually no utility data available. You have nothing available. At least, at least there you got data available limited in a partially vacant. Here you got nothing. Okay. Then what we do is pretty much follow what the utilities do in our state for incentives. And what they do and what we do is we say you can model the space 
using any model. Okay, we don't. We have no requirement that you use eQuest or, you know, Trace or Energy Plus or what have you. You do it the way you want to do it. Okay. <coughs> you put the existing equipment. Okay, that's there. It's already you know it's there. It's up on the roof. It's, the windows are there. What have you. Okay. <coughs> But when you look at the uh, existing equipment, uh, you have model A with existing equipment. Model B is my new equipment. So you run the model again with the new equipment, and you operate it the way the office building is going to operate. And you look at the delta between the two. OK, so you're using modeling to establish the baseline with the existing equipment that's there, of which you're all going to replace. And then you're looking at the existing building with all the new equipment in the model, okay, operating the way it's expected to operate as an office building or as whatever kind of building it happens to be. Okay, so in doing this we can deal with both an existing building, it's staying an office building, it's staying a, a warehouse, what have you. It's just it may be partially vacant or it may be fully vacant. Okay, does that make sense? Anybody have any other ways that one can deal with this that you've seen or you've heard of? Or I, I, I just have a question. Sure. With, with the existing equipment, would you factor in a depreciation number to compensate the age? No. No, you don't need to. You know, with, with us, it would be, it would be as if that existing equipment is operating as if it, it would be as if it was fully occupied with that existing equipment which is going to maybe last another week or two or ten, whatever. That's your baseline. Okay, and then you're going to redo the model with the new equipment and see what the delta is. Okay, any other questions on that? Okay, this is not as common as this case, especially here in Connecticut where we see many of the buildings being totally repositioned, especially the old industrial sites, many of the old industrial areas in Connecticut. We have an old industrial plant, and now it's being converted to high-end anything, from condos right through to, to office. Okay, and, and again, the way that we've uh, included it in the program to be covered, this, this really follows pretty much the way your incentives are in the, with the utilities, as I was alluding to. You, can, you have to project the baseline, but you're using a model, <clears throat> and the key here is <clears throat> you're looking at all the energy using equipment you need. Well, I need to... It's, an, it's, an, it's a brick building shell. There's nothing there. No windows. No, no rooftop air conditioning. I'm laughing, but I, you know there's a couple of them around. We got one right now. Okay, well, the idea is you're going to be modeling it with the equipment that you want to put in. But, and this is important, the equipment that you, when you run the model, the equipment that you're putting in has to be energy code equipment. So you've got to be, in Connecticut, we follow the 2009 International Energy Conservation Code, the IECC. Okay, so when you look at what it requires, you're going to model it with coded equipment, energy complying with that code. Then you rerun the model with whatever new efficiency equipment you want to put in. So I want to put in super efficiency this, super efficiency that, what have you. Okay, and the delta between the equipment operating under code versus the equipment operating with this high efficiency uh, that you're going to put in, that's the delta savings that you have. Okay? Now, bear in mind when you do this, the savings is no, in all of the other work we've done, we've used baseline, actual baseline data of some sort which in many cases is way below the code. Okay, in, in Connecticut under our CPACE, we don't mind that. That's your baseline data. Only in this case will we have none of that data. We have to come up with a baseline to still cover it by CPACE. And the only way we can come up with in talking with the utilities is to do exactly the same thing that they do and let it be based on the, what does the code require? What are you putting in? And the delta would be the energy savings that you're dealing with. Questions on that? 
Okay, because there's a lot, of, a lot of property, especially along the rivers, that is being repositioned into, and especially now into office, really nice office and, and multifamily. It takes a lot of the ability, though, to use this. I know, it it's does. The it's the big, it is, you know, at least we can, we didn't even think you could do this scenario in CPAs. At least there's a way to do it. But the delta is going to take a lot away because it's, it's not the full, real, you know, there's no actual baseline. So you, you're going to assume that it's got 2009 code equipment. And you're only going from 2009 to, to the high efficiency that you're, that you're going to, that's not going to be a big number. Compared to if I had equipment there, which was like antiquated, then I got a big delta. So we can cover it, but you're right. It's not, not going to make you jump out of your socks. Now there's a question in the back. Yeah. Yeah, the, in the incremental cost of the investment. It's going to cost me this much more money because what we're doing is encouraging people to spend more money based on that. And this, it's the, the real issue. This has been popular, but every time we've looked at it, we came into the problem that you brought up. The savings when you're using the 2009 energy efficiency, it's not, I mean, it's, it's minuscule. It's not a lot. It's a toughie. But at least we could say, yes, we cover the scenario. And people ask us about it, and we tell them. But it's, it's not something that's going to be overpowerful on the savings standpoint. Question, Tom? I had the exact same question as you guys. Same thing? I wanted you to bring that up. Yeah. So that, that's the issue. But at least we can say we cover it. OK? I'd say this would be, you know, this is the one that you probably see more often. And, and we, this can go through the finance. Because now we've got data, existing equipment. It's not dealing from ground zero with absolutely nothing. With the uh, sub-metered, multi-tenanted buildings, um, and remember the, the, that split incentive issue, you know, where I'm the building owner and I got to put in all of the upgrades and the tenant is getting the benefit. Okay, that's the split incentive. Where that typically, there's two types of way that these leases are written. There's multiple ways, but there's two primary ways in our state and most states for us in commercial real estate. We either have a triple net lead lease or a gross lease. In Connecticut, probably uh, it's about 50-50. A gross lease means I pay, I'm the building owner, I pay the electrical cost. I pay the fuel cost. It's all built into your lease. So obviously, if I've had very high energy costs, I already built it into the lease that you're paying. So if you come in with savings, that's going, I'm going to realize them. Because that person's still paying that lease. Okay, they're stuck with that lease for three years, five years, two years, whatever the heck the lease is. The other is a triple net lease, which about roughly the other half of the state is where tenants actually pay the property taxes, they pay uh, fuel, uh, fuel costs, the, the various different things. The case where you're dealing with a triple net lease, where, you know, I have a tenant, they pay the electrical costs. That's really where the big issue is. You know, I'm a building owner. Think about it. I, if I put in all that energy efficiency equipment, <clears throat> you know, I, the, the, the think, who's, I pay for it. Who gets all the benefit? The tenant. They're going to pay low because they're paying the electricity costs. It's that split incentive just to understand that that is important to, to think about as we get into the multi-tenanted buildings. Because there are ways to deal with it. Uh, we have things called green leases, by the way, where, and there's also things like leases may run out, and, and when leases run out, there are things that can be done, added to leases to get tenants to pay. In many cases, if you're dealing with triple net leases, we always recommend that you sit down and talk with the building owner, the building owner talks with the tenants, because everybody's going to make out in it. You might as well do it all up front. How can it be done? There may be ways to do it. But with gross leases, it's pretty easy to do. The, when the tenants pay their own, it's a little bit more difficult to do. Question. Where you have the individual metering for apartments, condos, whatever, uh, what happens a lot of times... You know, yeah, let me give you the... Oh, sorry, you the yeah. Where you have the individual uh, metering in apartments, condos, things like that, what you'll commonly see is uh, most incentive programs, and I don't know about the seat case, but they'll only touch things, because you're always going to find the one holdout that doesn't want to do it. Yeah. So what do you do? Uh, 
most incentive programs will only go after the common areas, common area lighting, common heating, if there's a cooling plant, something like that. So I don't know how, you know, you, you have a different reference for it. the third, uh, what do you call it, the third? The third. That's what happens when Wait. you get at my age. <laughs> Oh, mine. <laughs> oh, yours? <laughs> oh, mine. When, when, when I think of what the, th what the third is, I'll let you know. No, where, where you can actually go after the whole building. Yeah, well, that's, that's the idea here. You know, if you're, you have some options that we've seen people look at, okay, where, in effect, if you could get the building's aggregate data, you know, the total aggregate, would you now, but you need utility cooperation to get the aggregate. And, of course, uh, this could be a very time-consuming step. Okay, that's a possibility. The other thing too is if you are able to get certain tenant data, we'll allow you to model, you know, as so, so long as they're the same types of tenants, you know, to do it. But again, we talk about a minimum of 10%. We're pretty flexible on that. That's an arbitrary number because we like to do the project, but you know, you've got to get some sort of data. And you know, when, when each of these sub-meters exists, whether in multifamily, it's very, very difficult because there's confidentiality issues. You're almost limited to this, unless there's other reasons and rationales for some sort of a, a, a program where people can work together. But trying to get data from the utilities is very, very difficult. We have the green button, as you know, in our state, Genevieve mentioned that, where you know on projects you can get access to the historical uh, energy data you know, using the green button, which is great, but you still need somebody's password. And so you've got to get permissions. It just it takes a little bit longer if you're dealing with the multi-tenant scenario where they're sub-metering. Yeah. Let me let me get you this so we can because you I hear part of it but not all of it. Got, got it, Mike. I just wanted to say that in the past, uh, the utility data is available for most facilities, 300 kW or larger. Otherwise, you're not going to get it. Not what what size? 300 kW. Or Oh, <laughs> okay, 300, okay, 300 kW or not, it's not available. That's first time I've heard that. Uh, in, oh, in the intervals. Yeah, okay, okay. <clears throat> but again, it's still, you've got to get it. And that, you know, if you want aggregate, because you need, you need the energy use of the full building, not just the common area. Okay, now if you're dealing, it depends. If you're looking at a targeted ECM, solely for the common area, that's different, but most of the time you're not. You're looking at something for a larger area than the common area. So it's a more complicated, but it's, if you come up with anything like this, what I would suggest is come to us and we'll try to put our heads together and come up with some way of possibly dealing with it. You know, we have a, a good relationship with the utilities, both CLMP and UI, and while I'm not sure we can accelerate getting data, at least we can have them listen to the story and the case and then uh, hopefully, eventually, at some point in the future, get the data. But it's gonna take a little bit of time, just bear that in mind. The other two are a lot easier to deal with because all of the controls are within ourselves. This, this one is not. This one, if you can get some of the data, some of the tenants to supply some of the data, you know what's there, you, know, you can do some modeling. So these are cases where you're gonna be involved in modeling in some way, and we allow that to establish the, uh, the baseline. So the bottom line is that we're trying to be as broad as we can on the different project types, the different scenarios. Uh, even though initially you might not have even thought they would be eligible for CPACE, many of these programs could be. We're very creative. The name of our game is we, we want to get more and more projects. So the more projects that you bring to us, no matter how crazy they may be, let us think about it. Let us talk to you about it, and maybe there's a way uh, to do it. So you can see we're trying to be as flexible as we can in the program, and uh, hopefully be able to get a project uh, in for you and for uh, our financing for financing in our program. Questions related to those baselines? We have to go relatively quickly now. Anything else? Any other questions? On a, on a building where the what percentage? Say you have a, a, a retail. Let me give you this too. Say you have a retail building and uh, you know there's major electrical usage, but they only want to change out the parking lot lighting or the common area lighting. Is there a certain percentage of how much savings there has to be overall from that, 
or they'll just take a look at the lighting savings? Yeah, they'll, uh, if you're going to just do lighting, that's all we're going to look at. Yeah, it's not going to be anything more than that. That's, so well, that's also what we would, that. right, plus that, right, plus we would consider that a targeted ECM. You know, it's real, that can go through very quickly through the program because it's very targeted, it's fast tracked, okay? Then we're not worried about the, the rest of the building could have an old boiler that you're not going to touch, but you're focusing just on this. Question in the back? Yeah, Mike. you touched on the scenario um, where you have a change in use and the new tenant's going to have a higher energy use even with more energy efficient measures. How do you do your estimate? It depends on how you, it depends on how you do it. If you're going to, remember, you can run the model with, you, if you're going to assume certain types of equipment go in, okay, you're going to assume more efficient equipment goes in, right, than, than what would have been there under the code. Is that the scenario you're talking about? Yeah, I guess, I mean, you bring the change from just a, a, you know, a regular service provider to a data center. The future use, even with ECMs, is going to be much higher than the current use. There's still, so you have to model it as if the new tenant was there using older. Let's look at it. That's a good question. You're in this, um, which scenario is it? Is it well? Is it going to be? It's a, it's a, is it a, is it a same use building? It's, it's a building that's going to go through renovation, and in that process, you bring in new tenants. Renovation, in other words, you're in th uh, this one. Or, or forget the renovation, but you're bringing in new tenants, and in that process, you want to take advantage of the opportunity to, to bring in ECMs. But in your modeling, their use because they're a data center, maybe they have a huge bank of refrigeration or something. <laughs> Their energy use, the future energy use, even with ECMs, is going to be higher than the old energy use with the old outdated equipment. So what's it do to your SIR? That's going to hurt it. How do you address that? Well, it's, it, it, we'd have to take a look at the individual, right, what's so going to happen. Specific. Yeah, there's no, there, there's no, you may have to remodel it, maybe assuming, and again, it depends on which scenario you're in, but you may have to remodel it, assuming there's a tenant there with a data center yeah, okay. that, that met the code. And then now you got the new tenant in there with an updated, more efficient system, and look at the delta. Again, it depends on, you first, you can't, when you question, you can't deal with the, it's difficult for us to deal with a question without getting which scenario you're in. Once you identify the scenario, then we can deal with the, the answering the question. That's why I say it's a little, you got two things, two, you got one equation and two unknowns. Difficult to answer. But you understand conceptually. Yeah, well, you may get more efficient. The change in use is often the same time. It's a good opportunity to make the improvements, bring in the ECMs, and benefit from that. Yeah. So you can do the modeling part. Yeah. The mod but, it, but you can do the modeling. Yeah. You can still do it. Just It's a little more complex. Yeah, that's right. Other questions? Yep. Um, what is your minimum threshold for CPAs in general? Roughly uh, 150,000 or so. Although we have a program called Boiler Light, which is made for just upgrades, new boilers, high efficiency boilers or conversions from fuel oil to natural gas, and they may be twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars at a clip. Is that only for natural gas, by the way? No, we'll we'll look at uh, if you want to go from a high efficiency, a low efficiency oil burn, oil oil fired system to a high efficiency oil fired system we'll look at that and it could be smaller but as a guideline remember there's there's a there's a lot that goes behind the scenes you know in from technical review on down that's why it's tough to do and all the stuff that has to get done on a really really small project so generally we try to isolate them if you got just boiler projects i think the smallest boiler project we did was around 30,000 just boiler nothing else replacing the boiler we could do that but generally on the ECM projects we like to see projects in that hundred fifty thousand dollars on up and if you look at all these projects around here they're all running probably in the three to five hundred thousand six hundred thousand dollar that that area yeah what was the second question hey, uh, going back to this fellow with the utility rebates okay uh, and that's why I asked about the minimum 
we have a project that's approved by the utility already for incentives. Uh, gross value, 150000 Okay, net out of pocket, 100000 Okay, so you're saying that really... What you do is before you leave, you sit down and we'll enter the project in the program, right? That's perfect. We can do that. You've got to just, what you've got to find out is what is the SIR, the way we look at it. Remember the utility, obviously if the SIR, the way the utility looks at it, which is the delta between compliance and what you're actually doing, if that SIR is greater than one, it's a no-brainer. If that SIR is not, then you have to go back and get the base, our baseline data, which is the actual energy use of the building. We're not, making, we're not making any assumption that you have to have everything up to code. It's whatever's there. It's whatever that energy use is. So you might have to do a little extra work. But that's the type of project that we'll take a look at. Let us take a look at well, it. I would believe that would qualify, but what is your average turnaround on that small project? Well, I mean, remember the, 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 the our turnaround internally between CFIA and us is not that, I mean, you're going to hear, you're going to see schedules later on when Genevieve talks. But the issue is there's certain things we don't, none of us control. And that's if a lender has to provide a consent. Okay? You can kick them, move them, beg, plead. They could take their time. And we, there's nothing we can do about it except gently prod them. You know, we're the government, try to move them a little bit. But if that, we don't control that. That's the thing that, if we could figure out how to control that, it'd be phenomenal. But bear in mind, as more and more of the lenders participate and agree to lend, you know, to consent to have this priority lien, it becomes less and less of an issue. So over time, you know, it's 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 slowly trending to be pretty quick. But there are still issues there that we have no control of. We can't deal with it. It's going to be whatever it's going to be. So I can't answer. But you'll see on the projects we've done, she'll go through the schedule, so you'll get a chance to see it. Okay. Question. On the, um, you mentioned that it's boiler light. Yeah. Okay. Does that, can that also include an asbestos it could, If asbestos piping is going to be replaced, asbestos is related to the piping, it could be included in the project. Okay. Yeah. It has to be related to, so you have to replace the piping. Not, not the piping, but I mean. Oh, on the, on the yeah. Oh, sure. You're yeah, you're taking the old boiler out. And you, yeah. 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 Yep. 